I'm even going to suggest, let me, I'm even going to suggest that I'm going to rob you of your time to go out and enjoy the, the nice, uh, the nice weather <laughs> that we're having. Uh, a little fog doesn't hurt anybody. And uh, normally I want to do that, but we are so tight on time this afternoon that I think as soon as the offering is finished, we'll just pick it right up. People here in about the second row, third row from Oroville. Yeah. I've been to my seminars up there. set the, uh, the recording equipment. I'm going to make a couple of announcements. Um, at the, the next meeting, when we switch over here to the Camellia Room, it will be done by my son, Matthew. And if some of you have seen his programs on creation and evolution, you know that they are pretty interesting. Uh, he's going to take some animals that you know and some you don't know and tell you some things that you know and that you didn't know. And so he's going to be doing that for a little while. Um, then we'll have our questions and answers. Here's what I want to mention. We will have our CDs, DVDs, etc. available. What, we're, what I am giving you this weekend is sort of a um, self-edited version because we are wanting to broadcast this uh, to those who may be Adventist and also not Adventist as well. So I am not including a large amount of things that I normally include in a regular seminar. If you do want to get what I normally have in seminars, we have that available in, in four varieties. We have it available in DVD and CD and Bible study format and book format, face to face with the real gospel, which Amazing Facts has printed for a number of years. And so those are all available in different formats if you want to study it carefully for yourself. In fact, we even have a short version of my series and a long version of my series. We've got everything that we can possibly develop on this. I also want to mention that I always bring with me what I call extra study materials, little booklets and pamphlets on things that I think are important. If you would like to take a little extra material home with you for your own personal study, when we get over there to the Camellia Room this evening, just ask and I'll be delighted to share some things with you. And finally, uh, my website is available for you to dig through if you want to. It's not an exciting website like Amazing Facts has, where you can do all kinds of fun things. Mine is a pure old-fashioned study website. You can read stuff on it. You can take a Bible course on it. You can learn more about God's plan of salvation. And if you want to explore my website, learn how to spell my name. You have it in front of you. It's DennisPreby.com. And you are welcome to browse through my website and see what you can find there that might be of some benefit for you. All right, that's how we're going to proceed. As soon as we are done with this presentation, which will be one hour exactly, uh, uh, we will move over to the next room and uh, the Camellia room, and there we'll finish out the rest of the program because Matthew will get it set up during this time so we can get started right away as soon as you're over there. We're really pushing the time element very much this afternoon because of another program coming up this evening. So uh, every minute is kind of precious here as we have this afternoon. All right. Well, welcome back, everybody, to uh, our final session this afternoon. Um, 
Elder Dennis Preby is here again. He's going to finish off this afternoon. I believe the subject is perfection. Hmm. So there's an interesting topic that we can consider this afternoon. So Elder Preby, once again, the floor is yours. And uh, Are we ready? thank you. Who feels perfect today? That's a subject that we don't talk about very much because nobody feels very perfect. And so it's a frightening word. You know what I found about frightening words? We need to stare them right in the eyes and see if they've got all the fear that we think they have. So we're going to look head on into this word. We're not going to dodge it today. We're going to see what we can figure out about this word perfection. And you know, a very important key in, def in, in making sure we're clear on it is defining our terms correctly defining what we mean by the words that we use. For instance, sin. As we talked about in a previous presentation, sin is either the nature we inherit, our birthright equipment, or it is the character we develop. Those are your choices. Sin, the sin for which you are guilty, is either your nature or your character, your choices. Now, once you've decided that, you have automatically decided what the word sinlessness means. Sin, sinlessness. If you believe that sin is the nature you inherit, then you'll be sinning by nature until Jesus comes. And sinlessness will be the sinless nature you receive when Jesus comes. So then we'll be sinless when Jesus comes. If you believe sin is by nature. However, if you believe that sin is the character, the choices we make, then sinlessness means a sinless character, like Jesus had, and maybe, just maybe, it's possible to have that experience before Jesus comes. So, you see, just by defining a word, sin, you have defined, decided when and how sinlessness will ever be a reality for human beings. Now the word perfection. It has four different meanings. Guess why there's confusion? Not just two. Four different meanings for one word. So let's go through those meanings. Absolute perfection. And I mean absolutely perfect. I don't mean somewhat perfect. I mean every time. You never take the wrong road on the freeway. You never get off the wrong exit. You never hit your thumb instead of the nail. Absolute perfection. Who is absolutely perfect? Next slide. There is only one being in this universe. There are three of them, of course, but there is one that is absolutely perfect, God himself. You know, even the angels aren't absolutely perfect. The angels who stayed in heaven for 4,000 years did not leave heaven, were loyal to the Father. When did they lose their last link of sympathy with Satan? At the cross? They didn't understand everything. They wondered if God handled this thing right. God said, be patient. Hang in there with me. I'll make it clear to you. Even angels had to readjust their thinking. That's not sin to readjust your thinking when new information comes in. The angels never sinned, but they weren't absolutely perfect. Okay, that's definition one. Definition two, nature perfection. That's the same as a sinless nature in the previous definition of sin. Sinless nature. Next slide. At birth, we receive a sinful nature. No choice in that. At the second coming, we will receive a sinless nature. Not one second before, which is the same as nature perfection. Notice, please, there's no human decision in any of that. You have nothing to say about it. How you're born, what kind of nature you're going to get at the second coming. God takes care of that. I'm going to leave that in his hands. So nature perfection is nothing that we are concerned about today. It isn't going to happen. God says, don't worry about it. I'll handle that. So we don't have to even be worried about nature perfection. Definition three, character surrender. When you come to Jesus, how much of your life do you surrender to him? All. Now there's a qualifier to that. All of whatever you know at that point in your life about yourself and God. Are there some people that don't know much? about themselves and God? Did the thief on the cross know very much about God's plan? 
but he knew he was a great sinner and there was a Savior right next to him. Do you think that took faith? He was being crucified too, the one that could save him. And the thief on the cross had that faith. So, all of what you know must be in his hands. No hidden rooms, no little things back here that you're going to hold for yourself. You give it all to him. That's character surrender. Give it all to him. Now, if this is working right, this is going to be a growing process in which you continue to learn more. Is that right? Every day of your life about God and yourself? Are you going to be growing every day? You're never going to be static. New information, new understanding, God's way of dealing with things. You are going to be moving ahead. And that's this circle of surrender is going to expand. Still the same circle. And expand. More territory covered. More information known. And this circle widens as you continue to grow in this character surrender every day of your life. Next slide. We are guilty because of our sinful choices. Perfection, the Bible meaning of perfection, is a series of sinless choices. Don't let the word sinless scare you. It's a sinless choice to accept Jesus as your Savior. It's a sinless choice to return to God a little bit of what He has given to you. That's a sinless choice. It's a sinless choice to worship Him on the Sabbath day. You make a lot of sinless choices. That's character surrender. That leads to character maturity, definition four. And human decision is involved in every step of that process. So the only two meanings of perfection that affect us today are definitions three and four. Not one and two, absolute no, nature no, but character surrender leading to character maturity. Now I want to make this point as clear as I can. Definition three, character surrender is the only requirement for salvation now or ever. And I mean that. God will never ask the question, how long have you been a Christian? How mature are you? Uh, how many degrees do you have in righteousness by faith? Those are not the questions. There's only one question God will ask. It's the only one he wants to know. Do you love me with all your heart? That's it. The playing field is even. You can love God with all your heart if you know very little about God or know a great deal about God. You can love Him with all your heart. And if your answer can be right here today, I'm going to say, if your answer today is, I don't know of anything I'm withholding from God. As far as I know, my entire life is in His hands. I will allow Him to direct me 100% of the time. That's my choice. If you can say that honestly, you have the assurance of salvation today, even though you know you have some maturing to go, some growing. If you can surrender your life to God today, you have everlasting life right now. Definition three is the only requirement for heaven. Definition four is preparing us to be happy in the presence of Jesus and the angels and the heavenly Father in our lifestyle and in our attitudes. So it's definition three that is the determining factor in salvation. Definition four, we'll see what that is for as we continue on in our study. So, character perfection. That's what I'm going to be focusing on this afternoon. And I'm going to be going through some Bible texts with you. And I want to ask you the question as we go through in your own mind, does the Bible teach the reality of character perfection I would call it character maturity. You can call it any name that you want. Does the Bible teach that we can be perfect in character in this life? You decide as we go through these texts. We start with Jude, verse 24. Now, one more thing to say about the text we're going to read. Every single one of the texts I am going to read this afternoon is a promise. There are many commands in the Bible. I'm not going to read any commands today. I'm only going to read promises. This is the first. Jude, verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Is that a promise? Did you see there that he is able, not you? He is able to keep you from falling. When that feeling comes across your mind, it lets somebody have it. He is able to say, no, 
Christ wouldn't do that, and you don't want to do it either. He is able. He will present you. He will do it. Let's continue. I'm going to read 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Another promise. First half of the verse is what I'm focusing on. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Now, if he's given, delivered you out of a temptation, what haven't you just done just then? You haven't fallen under the temptation. You haven't sinned. He has delivered you. Promise number two. He has delivered you. Now to the biggest promise of all, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. We're going to spend a little time on this one. This is so big, so important. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There are three promises in this one verse. First promise, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. You're not in this, on an island. We're all together in this boat. Every one of us gets tempted and tempted hard. That's promise number one. We're all together. Number two, but God is faithful who will not suffer. That means allow you to be tempted above that you are able. That's promise number two. You know, Satan would like to take us down when we're at our weakest. Have you noticed that sometimes you're stronger than others? You may be really stressed out. You may be sick. You may, things may be really bad. Satan would just love to come at you with full bore right then. And God says, uh-uh, Satan. They can't handle that right now. You can do that another time. God will not allow Satan to bring unfair temptations to you that you can't handle at that time in your life. That's a big promise. And then the biggest one of all. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. You know, maybe we can just forget about these definitions and what perfection is and what it isn't and all the rest and simply ask the question, is there a way of escape for every temptation that comes to me? Every one? Is that what the Bible says? Then the only question left should be, What's the way of escape? How can I find that way of escape? Let's not argue about what is or isn't possible. Let's just ask the question, if there's a way of escape, Lord, help me to find a way of escape when a temptation comes to me. Let's get practical. And right now, for a few minutes, I want to be practical with you. We've been theological for a while. Now I'm just going to drop that, and we're going to get very, very practical because I want to find out if there is a practical way of escape when a very strong temptation comes to me out of my own nature. How can I find a way of escape? I have found one thing that I don't like about myself very well. When a very strong, enticing temptation comes to me that I feel like dwelling on for a while... Somehow, for some strange reason, I just don't feel like praying right at that moment. I'll get around to it, Father. I'll talk to you in a few minutes, okay? The battle is gone. It's lost right there. Because, you know, I found out that it's a hard thing to sin against God while you're on your knees talking to Him. That's a hard place to sin while you're on your knees talking to Him. But, folks... It's not ambulance prayer. Lord, I'm going down. Get me out quick. It's something called preventive prayer. Is it better, folks, to have a great team of heart surgeons to patch you up after a heart attack or to prevent it by your lifestyle and your choices? Always better to prevent, right, if you can. Preventive prayer. Here's how preventive prayer works. And this is very important, very specific, and very practical. I would urge you to really think and pray about this. Preventive prayer goes like this. Lord, I have this problem with. Here's the problem. You name that problem before the Lord. You don't go saying, Lord, forgive me for my sins. No, no, no. I have this problem with. The single biggest problem that you face in your life, the sin that gets you most often, the sin that takes, makes you feel most like a hypocrite, you just want to give up because it happens over and over and over and you don't know how to deal with it. That sin. And it'll be different for all of us. But there's a sin, I guarantee, a temptation in your life that is really almost overpowering. You name that sin before the Lord. 
Don't name five, don't name three, don't name two, name one sin. You can only deal with one thing at a time. I have this problem with, Lord. I've had no success in dealing with it. I have had no victory. Lord, I am asking you to do whatever it takes to give me victory over this sin. Boy, that's a tough, uh, that's a big order. Whatever it takes. Wow. That might mean loss of a job, a career, a sickness, an accident, all kinds of disasters happening because the Lord is going to get through to you if you give him permission in any way he can so he can save you for all eternity. Are you willing to say that to the Lord? Do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to give me victory over this sin. See, you really have to mean it. Now, if you're not quite there, if you don't know that you're ready to pray that prayer, do whatever it takes, you have to pray another prayer before you ever get to that prayer. It's called, Lord, make me willing to be willing. I'm half willing. Now make me fully willing. You've got to pray that prayer and mean that. And then when you're really willing, then you can say, Lord, I have this problem with. Name it before the Lord. Write it down if you have to. Put it in your Bible if you have to. Do whatever it takes. Make sure that's your focus for the next period of your life. And ask God to do whatever it takes to give you victory over that sin. And you wait and see what happens. You just wait and see. God will do some things you will you'll never believe. You will begin to hate what you once loved. I guarantee it. And love what you once hated. God has that power. I have seen it happen in my life. You've seen it happen in your lives. And we want more of that. He will change us from the inside out. Okay. That's one area in which we can find victory over sin, preventive prayer. Now, I am going to share with you, and I'm going to put it up on the screen, an inspired statement which tell, is going to tell us so much about what God can do for us in this process. Next slide. If Satan seeks to divert the mind to low and sensual things, that's his specialty. And he's doing that all the time with us, pulling our mind down to his level. Next slide. Bring it, that's your mind, back again and place it on eternal things. Okay, how does this work? Bring your mind back. You know, there's one thing God is not going to do for you in this battle against sin, temptation. There is one thing he will not do for you in the promises of the way of escape from every temptation. He will not ever choose what you think about. He will not choose your thoughts. That is a divine right given to Adam and Eve, and the one thing we have left from the Garden of Eden is the right to think and choose for ourselves. Jesus bought that right on Calvary, that you have the right to say yes to God or no to God. That's your right, and no one can take that from you. The right to choose. That's the one thing you have to do. There's going to be a lot of things you can't do that God will do for you, but he won't do that for you. You have to get your mind back on eternal things. So here it is. Now watch this carefully. Let's see how this is going to work. How do you get your mind on eternal things? I've mentioned one way, and that's prayer. Let's try a couple more ways. There is one thing that our parents knew very much, and we've kind of lost sight of it. Seems a little old-fashioned now. We have a lot of Bibles a lot of translations right here in this church we have a lot of ways to read God's Word we may have about six or seven or more Bibles at our home you know I find a strange thing when I'm holding meetings like this I ask people to look up a text they don't have a Bible in their hands at all they have something of metal and plastic in their hands and they get their fingers going on that metal and plastic and they say they're looking at my Bible text you can have the Bible with you in your pocket at any time. Is that right? Modern technology is so great. Who needs to memorize Scripture anymore? That's unnecessary. We have the Bible at every moment. We just whip it out and read the text. There it is. Memorizing? Eh. What about when you're in the shower? Hmm. Sleeping in the middle of the night? Hmm. Temptation hits you hard don't have a Bible what do I do now and our parents and grandparents knew that the greatest weapon against temptation ever devised by God was the memorization of Scripture 
get back, brothers and sisters, to memorizing Scripture. And listen, I don't care what you memorize. You can memorize the easy parts. It's okay. You don't have to do the genealogies. It's all the Word of God. You can memorize the Lord's Prayer. It's okay. You can memorize the 23rd Psalm and then push it a little farther. Memorize Scripture. And the moment, now here's the key, the moment that temptation hits you with power out of nowhere, where did that thought come from? Immediately at that point, you start speaking the words that you've memorized. You don't wait five minutes, five seconds. You immediately, that thought comes to you, I'm going to get him for what he did to me. Immediately you start remember, uh, quoting the, word, the scripture you memorized. You see, here's how it works. It's not rocket science. If you've memorized five verses of scripture, you have about two minutes of time on eternal things. That's the key, isn't it? Eternal things. If you've memorized 10 verses, maybe 5 minutes. If you've memorized a whole chapter, you might have 15 minutes on eternal things. And you're repeating all those words for 15 minutes. And by the time 15 minutes of Scripture is... What was that thought back there 15 minutes ago? It just disappeared. Because you've gotten your mind on eternal things. The more Scripture you have ready to go in response to a tempting thought the more time you have on eternal things and away from the low and the sensual. It's simple, folks. you just got to decide to do it. There's a third way. It's called singing. Really? It's easier to memorize a song than a scripture, isn't it? And you can just break out in song when a, when a tempting thought comes to you and you say, oh, I'm a monotone. I can't carry a tune in a bucket. God loves monotones. And he will just honor that choice of yours. And so at this point, folks, there are ways to keep your mind on eternal things. Prayer, scripture memorization, singing, you might think of more. And there are ways in which you make that choice. Remember, God doesn't make that choice for you. He's not going to make your choice to memorize scripture. Now, he'll help you memorize scripture, but you've got to choose it. He's not going to make the choice to get you quoting scripture. You've got to choose that. You make the choice. All of this is your responsibility, not God's. He'll encourage you. He'll help you. He'll support you. But bottom line, it's your choice. That's the one thing you contribute to the saving process is making the choice, making the choice to get your mind on eternal things. Because you see, believe it or not, we haven't even begun to talk about victory over sin by what I've talked about to this point. None of that is victory over sin. That's just the beginning baby steps to get to the point of victory over sin. But without that, it can't happen. So this, at this point, is not victory over sin. It's the process that begins victory over sin. Next slide. We'll see how this is going now. And when the Lord sees the determined effort made to retain only pure thoughts, he will attract the mind like the magnet. See, he's wanting to know one thing. Are you serious? Do you not want to go down that road again? And see, here's how it works. Satan is pulling your mind down to his level. You have given Christ permission to take hold of your mind and begin to pull it up to his level. Now is where the power begins to kick in. Next slide. He will purify the thoughts. Not you. You don't have the slightest chance to purify your thoughts. Now, you can put a facade in the front and say, my thoughts are pure, but down deep, you've got that fallen nature. And you can't get into that nature very well. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And so you will never, ever, ever be able to purify your thoughts. You know, scientists are beginning to help us on this a little bit. They're beginning to tell us that there are certain chemicals in the brain that are secreted that build up little, they call them boutons, French for button, on the ends of nerve cells so that a synapse can pass quickly over one passage of the brain nerve cells to another and get to the place it's supposed to go to the organs of our body. And the more you do something, the more chemicals are secreted to build up the pathway so it's easy. Why is it that you don't have to learn how to tie your shoes every time you try? You've got automatic pathways in your brain all set up for that. Why is it that once you ride a bicycle, you can pretty well ride a bicycle? 
because your brain has made automatic pathways so it knows how to do what you want it to do. Sends it to messages to the organs of the body. So at this point now, well, they're also telling us that amazingly, by making certain choices, those chemical secretions will dry up on certain nerve endings in our brains. And a brand new pathway can be built in our brain that wasn't there before. Can you begin to imagine what new birth really means scientifically? Why is it that when somebody says something very insulting to us, right in front of our face, three, three inches in front of our face, why is it that without thinking much about it, our face begins to turn a slightly different color than it was before? Well, it's simple. Because certain in input is given into your ears, passed on to your brain, the brain knows what to do with that because it's been done that way many, many times before. It sends an immediate message to the largest organ in the body, which is the skin. Blood vessels get to the surface quickly. It's time for fight or flight. Don't just stand there. Simple as that. Wouldn't it be neat if God could perform a miracle, purify the thoughts, send a new pathway, block the old pathways in our brain, send a new pathway down the brain, send a new message to the organ, the, the skin, saying, smile. Just smile. Don't even think about it. You just smile. Wouldn't that be a neat way of escape from temptation? You didn't do it. You just gave God permission to do it. He took hold of your mind, he pulled it up, and he got those nerve endings changed in your brain so that you think differently than you did before. We can have the mind of Christ, remember? We can have the mind of Christ. That is a possibility. Next slide. And enable them to cleanse themselves from how many? Every secret sin. That's how it works, folks. That's the way of escape. The way of escape. We're not done now. There's more. Next slide. The first work of those who would reform, first work is to purify the imagination. Oh, now we're really getting touchy, aren't we? I mean, here is the real, real sore spot within us. First work, if we're ever going to get it right, is to get the imagination under control. The imagination where we, you know, we're sitting here in church, we're listening, we're attentive. Is that the real you and the real me, what we do on Sabbath in church? Or is the real you and the real me when we're all alone by ourselves, no one else can look in, and we're thinking up here in our own little world? doing whatever we want thinking about. Why is it that we do certain things? Are you fully aware that some of the reasons we don't do certain things which are sin is because there are penalties attached to them? If there were any penalties, we'd probably do them. We're driving down the road right here in town, 35 mile an hour speed limit. We don't want to be bothered. We're driving 55 to 60. We're cruising down the road. Why is the most interesting thing on our vehicle at that moment the rear view mirror? Because we're good law abiding citizens. We're following every bit of what the city wants us to do. Or because the only reason for our obedience is the fear of a $300 speeding ticket. That's our motivation. Okay, we made it. We got home, safe and sound. We park our car in our garage, and we settle down in our easy chair, our favorite easy chair. And in our imagination, right up here, we get into the hottest Ferrari ever built because we love speed cars. And we set out all over town, not at 50 miles an hour, but 90 miles an hour. We cruise all over town. We don't worry about stoplights. That's for beginners. We don't worry about cops chasing us every time. They just crash up and we go on, just like in the video games. We have the greatest time doing anything we want in our imagination because no one can say, ah, ah, there's a penalty attached to thinking that way. Do you know that's where most of sin takes place? Right here, in our imagination, before it ever comes out on a word or, a, or an act action. Here is where sin happens 
in the imagination. The first work, if you're ever wanting to have victory over sin, is the prayer, God, please purify this imagination. Next slide, please. When tempted to yield to a corrupt imagination, then flee, don't walk. Flee to the throne of grace and pray for strength from heaven. Flee to the throne of grace when that imagination, you know where it's taking you, you've been there before. This is not beginners. You know where that thought is going to take you. And you flee to the throne of grace and say, I don't want that in my life. Really, I don't. Next slide. In the strength of God. Notice that. The imagination actually can be disciplined to dwell upon things which are pure and heavenly. If that imagination comes under the control of the Spirit of God, you are on your way to victory over sin. Have you noticed that everything beyond the first sentence that I read is about God's power, about God's presence, a God purifying our thoughts, strength from heaven, the imagination purified? This whole business of victory over sin is about 10% ours and 90% God's. But he will not move unless we ask him to. He will not move unless we take that first step of choosing to get our mind on eternal things. And then he takes over, and he takes over with power, and you will have that way of escape. I guarantee it. There will be a way of escape, not on paper, but in your life. And you will say, I don't even like that anymore. What was that that I was so crazy about back then? Ugh, I hate it. Have you learned that? Uh, some foods are that way the things you thought you'd never eat in the world you said okay I'll do it I know it's good for me and pretty soon it's okay it's okay first Corinthians ten thirteen, my friends is a powerful powerful chapter let's go on second Corinthians chapter 10 verse 5 here folks the next three texts we are going to read are some of the most incredible statements that I have ever read in Scripture. Here's what I'm going to warn you about. This is a product warning label right here. If your faith is weak, if you don't really believe the Bible all that much, you better not read these texts. They're going to flatten you out. Make sure your faith is strong before you ever read what we're going to read. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity most every thought to the obedience of Christ. How did I do? I read it to you the only way it makes sense. The only way that's logical. The only way that past experience has told us. The only way that most of Christianity understands the Bible the only way that another version of the gospel teaches yeah you can have victory over most every temptation most every one most every thought but this text doesn't say that bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ if every thought of yours was in captivity to Christ right now tomorrow next day next day how many sins would you be committing for the rest of eternity this is a promise that I said takes a huge amount of faith to believe. It is not based on evidence. The evidence isn't there that human beings have done that very well or at all. It is not based on common sense. It is not based on logic. It is not based on experience. It is based on the raw, naked Word of God. Straight up. Do you believe the Word of God is my question today. Do you believe what God says? Not what human beings say about the Word of God. This tests our faith to the limit. Now, having said all of that, next slide, please. Let's go back to the one that we talked about previously. Let's ask the question of Christ. What do you think? Was every thought of Christ in captivity to his heavenly Father? How long? Well, about 33 years or so, right? That's a long time for every thought. We can answer that question easily, can't we? doesn't take much thinking. Sure, every thought of his was in captivity. After the new birth, is that possible for us, according to what we've just read? That's the hard part to believe, isn't it? That every thought of ours 
can be like Christ. That's why I spent the last hour talking about Jesus Christ and his nature. Because if we don't understand that Jesus Christ faced these thoughts and surrendered them and they were in captivity to his Father, we'll never believe it could happen for us. To understand Christ is to understand righteousness by faith. To misunderstand Jesus Christ is to totally misunderstand how we can be saved. And that's the reality of another gospel that's getting a lot of traction these days among Christians. Well, let's try another text. That was tough enough. Let's get harder, okay? Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And by the way, just as a little sidelight right here, if you ever want to be sure about the word flesh that I mentioned, the word flesh in verse 17 says, The flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. That's not what's on our bones. That's our mind. Fallen nature. Fallen nature and the Holy Spirit are fighting each other. That's the definition of flesh. But that's another subject. Verse 16. This I say then. Walk in the spirit. And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now remember, lust of the flesh is not sin. James 1.14 says, We are drawn by our lust and enticed. That's temptation. Lust of the flesh is not sin. You've inherited that from birth. You struggle with it every day of your life. It is temptation. Sin is fulfilling the lust of the flesh. That's sin and you fulfill it in your mind, in your imagination. All right? So now let's reread the text. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not sin. That's what the text says. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not sin. Now, wait a minute. That's not right. I've been walking in the Spirit for 30 years, and I still sin occasionally. That can't be true. Do you see how most of our thinking about this is based on our experience? Not exactly in what God says, but how it's been for us or for someone else we know. It says, walk in the Spirit and ye shall not sin. Let's go back up to Jesus Christ. There it is again. Was Jesus Christ walking in the Spirit? Could he have sinned while walking in the Spirit? I'm going to say absolutely not. Because the Holy Spirit absolutely prohibits sin in your life or in Christ's life. You know the only way you can sin? We don't say it, but of course we do it. The only way you can sin, you've had, a Holy, you've had the new birth. You've had the experience of Christ in you. You are having a, a Christian walk. But one day you say, Holy Spirit, would you step over there for about ten minutes, okay? I'm going to be doing something you can't participate in right now, and then I'll get back to you ten minutes, okay? That's the only way you can sin you excuse Christ, the Holy Spirit and Christ from your life. Then you can sin aplenty. You can just do whatever your jolly well nature tells you to do. But the Holy Spirit is not there. He is not going to participate in sin. He will love you. Don't ever mistake that. He'll come back. You know, he comes back even when we plan our sin and our repentance at the same time. We do that. Well, I know this is wrong, but I know God will forgive me, so I'll go ahead and do it, and then I'll ask for, for repentance later. And then we want him back. He actually comes back. Can you believe that? Once we do that, play games with God like that? So the Holy Spirit will never stop loving you, but he can't control you. He, you can't have the mind of Christ. You can't his, have his indwelling presence. You can't have anything like what we're talking about here while you are sinning. And at that moment, you have to make that decision. Holy Spirit there or Holy Spirit here. It's one or the other. And if you're walking in the Spirit, you cannot sin. It's impossible. The Holy Spirit will not sin. And we'll read that in the next text. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 3, the toughest text in all of Scripture. 1 whole passage is important. I'll just select a few points in this passage. 1 John chapter 3. Let's look at verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. 
Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him nor known him. How about verse 8? He that committeth sin is of the devil. And then verse 9. Here's the real hard one. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed, that's God's seed, remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. There it is. That's scripture. He cannot sin. Christ couldn't sin as long as he kept the Holy Spirit in control of his life. And the same will be true for you and me. Now, this text is so impossible. This text is so much beyond credibility. This text is so far beyond our imagination and our dreams that we have come up with a better way of understanding this text that makes it make sense to us, makes it logical, and makes it reasonable. And here is what we're told on how to read this text. It's in the present tense in the original language. So go back to verse 6. Here is how we are told we should read this text. Whosoever is abiding in him is not sinning habitually. Verse 8. He that is habitually sinning is of the devil. Now, that makes a little more sense, doesn't it? If you're going along doing the same thing over and over and not repenting of it, the devil is running your life. But if you only slip now and then, occasionally, not habitually, then you are still walking in the Spirit and you are in a saving relationship with God. Occasional sin, mm, God will overlook it. Habitual sin, nope, that's it. It's too much. You're gone. The devil is running your life. Now, if that is the correct interpretation of this scripture, I'm going to ask you a very important question because it will determine how I'm doing and how you're doing in salvation. How many times... Must I, can I, that's the word, can I lose my temper per week to keep it occasional and stop it from being habitual? Per week. Five, which is that, occasional or habitual? Two, occasional or habitual? Ooh, that's tough. One time, just one time during the week I lost my temper, occasional or habitual? Oh my, you're a tough crowd. Do you see where we're going with this? We're counting up the number of times we can sin. You know what sin is? We're taking our fist and shaking it in God's face. I don't like your way. I'm not going to turn the other cheek. That makes no sense to me. I'm doing it my way. And we're counting up how many times we can do that and still be in a saving relationship with God. No. This is in the present tense, in both Greek and English. What is present tense? How about what happened five minutes ago? Is that present tense? Hmm. How about five minutes down the line? Is that present tense? No, it's future. Present tense is what's happening right at this moment. Not past, not future, right now. And this text, let's read it now, is just as the original language has it. Verse 6. Whosoever is presently abiding in him is not sinning at the present moment. Verse 8. He that is presently sinning is presently of the devil. See, you're either being run by Satan or you're being run by God. And it can change quickly. And so right here at this point, if you are presently under the control of the Holy Spirit, at this moment you're not sinning. But if at this moment you are knowingly sinning, then the devil is controlling you at that moment. And that's not good business. So I'm going to suggest here, here's a very important principle. If you have done something that you didn't plan to do, you sinned a sin of impulse, let's say. You weren't planning to do it. It just happened. The most important thing you can do at that moment to make sure that you keep your standing of salvation in place is to get down on your knees and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I messed it up. That hand, remember, that's slipping out of the hand of Jesus Christ? Get it right back in. He's not going to count milliseconds. He's not going to say, oh, but you sinned right there, and so you're out of salvation. No, if you get your hand right back in his hand by immediate repentance, I don't mean a day later. I don't mean when she says she's sorry, I'm say, I'll say I'm sorry. I mean at that moment you say, Lord, I did something that dishonored your name. I did something that discredited Jesus Christ. 
please forgive me, that hand goes right back in his hand. So yes, we slip and fall. But this text says that you either are in the Holy Spirit's control or you're not in the Holy Spirit's control. And if you're not in his control, that's bad news for you and salvation and God. So let's make sure we're in the Holy Spirit's control. These are impossible texts, aren't they? Really hard to believe. Really hard to believe. But did Jesus do all of them? And can we have the mind of Christ? I'm asking you and I'm asking me to believe what the Word of God says in spite of what everyone else says about the Word of God. In spite of our own past experience, in spite of our friends. Believe what God says and put him to the test. Can he do what he promises? We've read the promises here. I'm going to read one statement from Inspired, inspired Source here, which is God's Amazing Grace, page 230. If you have the outline, it's on page 2. God's Amazing Grace, our Savior, does not require impossibilities of any soul. He expects nothing of his disciples that he is not willing to give them grace and strength to perform. He would not call upon them to be perfect if he had not at his command every perfection of grace to bestow on the ones upon whom he would confer so high and holy a privilege. Did you notice there are no commands there? There are only promises? And it's all about grace? Look at those statements. He will give them grace and strength. He had every perfection of grace to bestow a privilege, it's called. See, it works kind of like this. We have two fists. And God says, will you just open up that fist of yours and allow me to pour in my forgiving grace? I will forgive the past, everything in your past. I will not hold you responsible. I will treat you as though you'd never sinned once in your life, okay? And what do we say? Okay. Pour that forgiving grace in. I love it. And then God says, now I have another gift. And you have another hand. Will you open up that hand and allow me to pour in some more grace? Same grace, but does a different job. It's called overcoming grace. There's forgiving grace, and there's overcoming grace. And we take a look at these two gifts. This one means I change my lifestyle, doesn't it? I don't watch the same things on TV I used to, doesn't it? Hmm. I don't eat the same kind of food I used to. Is that right, God? I like this gift. This one. Pour in some more forgiving grace, God. I want forgiveness. Please pour it in. I love your grace. Over here, I don't know. I don't know if I want to pay that price. Which of the two gifts is the better gift? Forgiving grace, overcoming grace. You know how much more important overcoming grace is than forgiving grace in the long run? One day, I think kind of soon, given events in the world that I see around me, this wonderful, beautiful gift of forgiving grace will be taken away by God, never again to be seen in the rest of eternity. And it'll be taken a lot while we're living on this earth in our fallen natures just taken away from us ripped away from us why because God rips things away from us that we desperately need does he ever do that he only removes things that are no longer relevant is that right when did the lamb cease to be sacrificed when the real sacrifice was offered and the only reason he will take away this wonderful, beautiful gift of forgiving grace is we have become so full of overcoming grace like Jesus Christ. We have the mind of Christ and we don't need this anymore. And Jesus can step out of the heavenly sanctuary and says, my work of forgiving is done. We'll move on to the real point in the great controversy, getting things back to normal and to happiness because of overcoming grace. That's how much more important overcoming grace is than forgiving grace. And most of the Christian world wants the forgiving grace, but not the overcoming kind. So right here, my friends, we have some important decisions to make. What do we really want? What do we expect Christ to do in our lives? 
Well, I'm going to ask you the question. Do you be- what, do, what do you think? Does the Bible teach character perfection in our lives before Jesus comes? You have to make that decision for yourself. Now, having said all that, I've got to back up a little bit. Next slide. Did I not say earlier that character surrender was the only qualification for heaven? Didn't I say that? Hmm. And I've been talking to you about character maturity for the last 30 minutes. I've wasted your time. Character maturity is not a requirement for salvation. Thief on the cross was not mature in character, but he was surrendered. Salvation was his. And you can be saved when your heart is surrendered, even though you're very immature. You don't understand a lot about God. You don't understand a lot about yourself, but you love him with all your heart. And you are saved. Character surrender. So why have I been talking about character maturity? Because... There's another issue facing this world. It is involved in the great controversy between Christ and Satan. Would you take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 22? We're right at the end of all things inspired in the Bible here, aren't we? Revelation chapter 22 and verse 11 says, There is a time coming when things will be different than they are now. It won't be like today. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man as his, according as his work shall be. There is a time coming when no more decisions will be made. Every decision will be final. And it will be before the end of this world. That's what most Christians do not believe because their gospel does not allow it. It can't happen in the standard Christian gospel. It can only happen in the Bible gospel. Overcoming grace. And so at this point, there will be a difference. I'm going to take you to the two most incredible promises that God has ever made in Scripture that just kind of boggle my mind that he would make these promises. Let's start in Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. I'm sure you know that we are living in verse 1 of chapter 7. It says, After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Oh, are we living in that day. The angels are really struggling to hold those winds, I guarantee you, right now, so that this world isn't a madhouse. And then verse 2. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. What's the promise here? Before Jesus comes, there will be the winds blowing upon the earth. And God is saying, don't let that happen. Don't let it happen until I've sealed my people. So no second coming and no violent destruction on this earth in total form until God's people are sealed. What does that mean? Turn to Revelation 14. Here is the incredible promise. Revelation 14. You know what Revelation 14 talks about. There are three angels that fly in the midst of heaven with the gospel, etc. But you know, before that description, a group of people are described. Verses 1 to 5. Revelation 14, verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him in hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Can you imagine what the seal of God really is. You just read it. The Father's name written in, not on, in your mind. He, you have the mind of Christ. He is in full control of you. And look at verse 5, what that will mean. Just look at it. And in their mouth was found no guile. Guile means deceit or hypocrisy. For they are without fault before the throne of God. Wow. When you receive the seal of God, the name of the Father in your forehead, you will be from that point forward 
totally without guile or deceit or hypocrisy and without fault before the throne of God. Maybe that's what will give power to the three angels' messages. What do you think? Maybe that's what will take it to the, as a loud cry to the world. All right, so what we're looking at right here. Has God made a promise here that he will find and seal a people before Jesus comes? What if, after God has sealed you or me, let's not talk about everyone, let's talk about you or me. He sealed you or he sealed me. And after that time, I sin against God. There's guile. There's hypocrisy. There's failure. Remember, God will never take away free choice. Not for all eternity. He won't take away free choice. You can always choose to sin for the rest of eternity. God never takes that right away. That's too precious. And after he has sealed you or me in our foreheads, you decide or I decide to sin one time. What does that do to God's promise? Let's go back to the previous slide for one more moment. Previous slide, there it is. What if Christ had committed one sin during his 33-year life? What would that have meant? Total destruction of the universe. Failure of God. When God places his seal on our foreheads and steps out of the heavenly sanctuary and closes down human probation, what happens if one person that he has sealed, what the seal is is very simple. It's a promise that God makes this person will never sin again. And what happens if you or me sin one time? That makes God a liar. And his plan is a failure. In exactly the same way it did, would have for Jesus Christ. And the seal of God is not a box around you. It is the mind of Christ and the Holy Spirit in you. And you can always choose to defy that at any moment. And so this is the promise made to Christ multiplied by 144,000 sinners. That's what it is. This is the most incredible promise God has ever made in all of Scripture. He will take, and you can argue about, you know, whether it's literal or symbolic. Let's not even bother with that. You can, here's the question. Can a whole generation of people living in all kinds of countries and all kinds of environments, can God get them to the point through overcoming grace that they will never sin against God and he can put his seal on their foreheads as his promise? Can that happen? Boy, does that take some faith or what? Where's the evidence that anything like that has ever happened except for Jesus Christ? Where's the proof that God can pull off this one this is the most incredible promise God has ever made in all of Scripture, and it will only done, be done by a miracle of God to get into our minds and purify those brain pathways and get us on to have the mind of Christ, to have that mind that Christ had 100% of the time. See, here is the real point. Um, I'm going I'm to ask you to think like Satan for just a moment, okay? When Jesus was dying on the cross, and especially when he was resurrected, Satan is pretty low. Boy, it's all down the drain. I don't think there's any hope for me. But I'll just hang on. I'll go off in a corner and hide. I won't talk to anybody, and I'll try to figure this thing out. And here's what I think. Based on past experience, maybe, maybe this can blow over, and I can try again. I, I, I think I'm going to do this. I'm going to wait until all those disciples are dead. It'll take a few years, okay, I know that. But after they're dead, I'm going to try the next generation of Christians and see if I have some success with them. I'm going to try it. It's, been, it's worked in the past. And sure enough, the next generation isn't quite as solid as the disciples were. And the next generation, and the next generation, and believe it or not, within about maybe 200 years, I'm getting the whole world back under my control again, including those Christians. And all of a sudden, by about the year 500 and 600, I've got the whole Christian church back in my hands. I am running Christianity. And for 1,000 years, I'm running Christianity. I'm running it. 
and all of a sudden my world is shaken a little bit. Someone nails 95 theses to a church door and I have to step back and say, wait a minute, this is not good. But I've learned my lesson. I'll wait till Martin is dead and I'll try again. And John Wesley, I'll wait till he's dead, I'll try again. And it's working. And all of a sudden the worst news comes out. Here's the people that God is calling into existence at the very end of time and God is speaking to them again. Uh Uh-oh, this is bad, but I'll wait. I'll wait. And you know what? I'm going to tell you Satan has all the evidence on his side, doesn't he? What group of people has ever completely fulfilled the purpose for which God called them? He's got all the evidence on his side but one, that God's promises are true and cannot fail. And I'm going to ask you today to believe the impossible promises of God. That's why I'm talking about character perfection. Because character perfection is the only way to complete the mission that God has assigned the last generation on earth. It is not about us being saved. It is about God winning the great controversy. That's why I'm talking about definition four. Because I want to be part of that generation. I want to help end Satan's rule on this planet. And it can be done only by God's miracle working power. And I hope you'll join me in that commitment. So I'm going to ask as far as possible that you'll just kneel with me and we'll pray for a miracle, okay? As far as possible. Father, this afternoon we have read promises that just stun us, that we can't believe what we have just read But right now, Father, we're going to trust you completely. Not our past experience. Not what people around us are saying. We're just going to trust you. And right now, I pray for a miracle. I pray for every person in this church to have a miracle of righteousness by the empowering grace of Jesus Christ that we have never had before. And I'm going to pray that we will follow the steps that are necessary to allow the Holy Spirit to so control our lives that we will hate what we once loved. Lord, we are weak, and we don't have much in the way of ability. But we will trust, we will believe, and we will ask for what is impossible, because with you, all things, all things are possible. So, Lord, we bring this prayer to you because we only pray it in the powerful and effectual name of Jesus Christ who has gone before us and showed us the way, and we ask for that miracle because of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and in his name we pray this. Amen. Well, that is our uh, seminar. A little different than I normally do it. Some of you have heard it in the past. This one we hope will be available for broadcast possibilities, so we're going to try to do that. Here's what I'm going to suggest now. Let's immediately, because I'm sure things are set up next door, let's immediately, those of you who want to continue, go next door to the Camellia Room, and we will have the sort of culmination. We do this in every one of my seminars. Matthew, my son, does his presentation on creation and evolution.